I'll just start with verse 1 and read on down five or six verses. Here's what the scripture says. Begin with verse 1. It says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Now listen to this very closely. This is the first message that Joshua receives from the Lord after Moses has left. And really, they know that Moses has gone up to be with God in the mountain, but they don't really know what has happened to Moses. And listen to this shocking, heart-rending, heartbreaking message that God gives to Joshua the first time he speaks to him here. And he says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Can you imagine tonight how Joshua must have felt when he realized that probably on earth the best friend he ever had, Moses, was now dead, and God told him he's dead. And I'd say that it broke his tender little heart. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. Now listen closely. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward The going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. You know, that's a powerful statement, isn't it? As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. Now listen closely. Here's part of my text. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Now I could read on and on, but the part I want to use tonight is where God promises Joshua, I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Now I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 49. get the baby it might get hurt here Isaiah chapter 49 and I'll just read several verses here verse 13 on down and listen real close it says sing O heavens and be joyful O earth and break forth into singing O mountains for the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. But listen to this, and sometimes we feel this way. Listen real close. But Zion said, and that's the church, the Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. How many has ever felt forsaken and forgotten? Have you ever felt forsaken and forgotten? Listen to this. I love this. I preached a series of messages on this years ago. And here's what God's reply was. Even though Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me and my Lord hath forgotten me, God says, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet will I not forget thee. Isn't that a great promise? Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Thy walls are continually before me. And here's what I want to preach tonight. Now, I mean, he's got about an hour or so. And I want to say this. I want you to prepare your hearts because I believe that while you're sitting there in that seat tonight, if you will listen closely to the Word, that the Word has the power to heal you. No matter what your need is, He can heal you right where you are. And I'm going to tell you, the Word is so powerful and such a force that the word can deliver you of depression right where you're sitting. 
If those people in California had had God's real word, they would have never committed mass suicide. There's one thing about having God's anointing and having the real spirit of God. You'll, it will never drive you crazy. The devil don't have the power to break you down. I said the devil don't have the power to break you down. I said the devil don't have the power to break you down. If you've got God's spirit, the devil don't have the power to break you down. Boy, doesn't it make you feel good to know if you've got the real spirit of God, there's not a power in hell that can make you take your life. Don't it make you feel real good to know that when you got the spirit of the Holy Ghost, there's not a power in hell, got the power or the authority to give you a nervous breakdown, cause you to fall apart and collapse? Boy, that's, a, that's an assurance. Here's what I want to preach tonight. Can you hear me? I want to preach three things. I've searched this book from Genesis to Revelation. I've studied it for about 30 years. I still don't know very much about it. But I want to. But I've come down to this. And the Lord spoke this to me. It took me 25 actual years to know this. So what I'm going to preach to you tonight is going to be 25 years of my life. Experiences and things that I've learned about God. And I want to preach three things that God absolutely will not do. Now that, first of all, I want to tell you that there's things that God can't do. He can't lie. Well, I wish I could get an amen. He cannot lie. It's not that he will not lie. Honey, he can't lie. Now, there's a difference in cannot and will not. Will not, listen to this, will not is determined by a decision based, based upon a plan and a will, God's will. And what I'm going to preach tonight is not to the sinner. It's not to the, oh, you can get it and change your destination tonight. I got a few, whoo, I felt that in my spirit. What I'm going to say tonight is to the children of God. And if you're a backslider, you're lost, or you never give your life to God, I, I may talk to you on these terms that if you want these promises, you have to change directions. But to you that are his, to you that belong to God, to you that belong to Jesus, There's three things that he will not do. We know that he cannot lie. We know that he cannot sin. It's not that he will not sin. You don't run around saying, you know, God wouldn't sin. That's not it. If you say will not, there is a tendency to put in there that, that this thing is, is brought to a comparison. But honey, it's not that he will not sin. It's he cannot sin. I've heard preachers say that Jesus was like us. He could have sinned. I said, you're so far wrong. Most people that say that are so far wrong, they don't even know what they're talking about. It's not that Jesus wouldn't sin. He couldn't sin. He became sin but wasn't a sinner. He became our sin but was not a sinner. He never committed sin and couldn't commit sin. All right, you might want to write a couple of these things down. There's three things that God will not do. And I'm talking to his children. If you belong to him, there's three things that he will not do. Number one, he will not fail you. God, I felt that. He will not fail you. And he will not forsake you. And number three, he will not forget you. That's this book in a nutshell. 
that's his promise to cover it all. I can take that and make it. I can take what I'm saying to you tonight and what I'm going to preach to you tonight by the help of God and stay free and defeat every devil that jumps up on me. Why? Because I know that this is true. How do you know? Because I just read it to you. He said so. Somebody say amen. The word will, I want, I want you just to remember that you might want to jot this down. The word will desire uh, has to do with God's desire or intentions or wishes. God has no intentions. I want you to remember this. Then I'll get to preaching in a few moments. God has no intentions of failing you. Well, it feels like he's left me. Yeah, you're basing yours on feelings. You've got to base it on saying. If he said it, he meant it. God has no intention. God has not decided to fail you. God has no desires or wishes to fail you. God has not decided to forget you or forsake you. He has no desire. He has no wish to. Amen. How many of you got children? Well, that pretty little baby went across there a few minutes ago. Well, Lord, I'd say that baby is so loved, there ain't a way in the world anybody could hurt it. Or they have no intentions nor desires of forsaking it. Failing it, come on. Well, if we as parents, how many's got children? Now, sometimes, you know, sometimes they get a little rowdy, you know. Just like my little grandson today, he throwed a fit on me. Because I wanted to stay home and rest, and he wanted to go down the road. And I said, Papa's wore out. He went and got his coat and says, go down the road. He wanted to go down the road. I had to take him twice. I have no intentions. J-Boy has no intentions. Our family has no intentions of failing that child. I had no intentions of failing Jay or Michael. You had no intentions, desires, or wishes. You have not decided to fail, forsake, or forget your children. If you and I are human beings and we're so frail, if we have decided that we can take care of our children, how much more does God want to do for us? I said, how much more does God want to do for us? Now listen to this. I want to read this real quick. The word fail. Everybody say fail. The word fail means to stop operating or start work or stop working. Do you believe God stopped working for you? It also means to be insufficient. Do you believe God's insufficient? No, he's not. It also, the word fail means to run short. Do you believe God ever runs short? You'll never find Jesus sitting somewhere on the corner of heaven said, I don't know whether I can take care of this or not. His resources are, are, are those that are of an endless supply. Yeah, but he just don't care about me. You're the bird I'm down here after. You're the one that I want to keep up tonight. Yeah, but everybody's got more God and gets more God than I do. You're another bird I'm after. You're misrepresenting my father. Yeah, but he does more for others. Maybe so, but you let him. It's not his fault, it's yours. Mom called supper when I was a kid, and I had me a little mad on, went out and climbed up in the sycamore tree somewhere and propped up between the limbs, got mad, wouldn't eat. It wasn't her fault that I come in at six o'clock and there wasn't nothing left. They'd all licked the platters and I was hungry. It wasn't, it wasn't that prodigal son's father that he went, uh, fault that he wound up in a hog pen. Boy, I'm getting some cold waves here. Now, Brother West, I've never had anything. I guess I'll always be a loser. I guess you will. 
but you don't have to be. Because these promises I'm talking about that he said, I'll not fail you. I will not forsake you. I will not forget you are promises to his kids. And that's you. And if you'll take a hold of this tonight, you can walk out of here headed down a new road with new possibilities, new probabilities, new results. Come on. Will somebody say amen? The word fail also means to be wanting or short when there's a need. It means to lose power. You ever been going up a hill, you was making about 70 on that interstate till you started up the hill and got down to 40, you lost power. God ain't going to lose power. He's not going to fail you. It also means to die away. It means to disappoint. It also means, the word fail means to give no help to. That's not God at all. It means to neglect. It also means to let you down or malfunction. Do you believe God would ever do that to you? Then there's no use to run around here acting like he's done it. Because when you do, you'll hurt his feelings and grieve his spirit. When he promised you, I'll not fail you. Come on. Also, the word forget. Everybody say forget. It means God said, I'll not forget you. It means I'll not lose memory of you. I'll not erase you from my mind. I'll not overlook you. I'll not lose sight of you. How many of you believe tonight that God has his eyes over you and he's always watching you? Come on. He's always there. And the word forsake, everybody say forsake. It also means, the word forsake means to abandon. It means to go away from or to leave. It means to desert or it also means to give up or give up on. Three things that God will not do. Now when I was outside there a few moments ago and I had planned on preaching something else, the Lord told me that there was a host of people here that needed this. And I'm here to tell you that no matter what Satan has tried to tell you, no matter what your flesh tries to indicate to you, when God says something, he means exactly what he says and says exactly what he means. Sometimes our religious upbringing and sometimes the roots of our religious beliefs have a tendency to put us into a spiritual state to where we feel like that we have to go through what we're going through because it's something for the glory of God. And sometimes that might be true in just a few rare cases but God's will for his children is to have them well God's will is not always done but it's to have us well it's to have us saved it's to have us delivered it's to have us free God's will to, to your life is to have your mind at ease to have your mind at liberty God that you can think logically and reasonably. It's God's will that you prosper and that you be in health. But sometimes Satan comes and because of circumstances and situations in our lives, if we're not real careful, he'll take those circumstances and situations and use them as levers or in leverage to get at us to try to convince us that God doesn't care. But I'm here to tell you that God does care. And I'm here to tell you that no matter what your state of mind is, no matter what you've been going through, it's God's will for you to know tonight that there's just three things that he is not going to do. He will not do. And he can tell you and he is telling you from his word, I will not fail you. You may be facing the awfulest thing that you've ever faced in your life. The doctor may have given you a bad report and told you that you're going to die of a cancer. The doctor may have told you that you have some kind of an incurable thing that nobody can help you with. Maybe your marriage is on the rocks. It may look like that you cannot succeed, that you cannot make it. It may look as though your finances are a catastrophe. Your business may be almost in the, in the brink of, of, of bankruptcy. It may look like your job is going down the tubes. But I'm here tonight in 
Kentucky in a little place called Renfro Valley to tell you that if you are his, if you belong to Jesus, if you have his spirit, if you're washed in his blood, if you're called by his name, he said, I am not going to fail you. Your money may run out. Your water may run out. Your food may run out. Everything in the world may fail you. But God said, I will not fail you. I will not let you down. I will not lose power when it comes to you. And no matter what your need is, I will never be in what I will never run out I will never lose supply David said though my refuge fail though the water fail though the government fail though social security fail Though the economy fail, though the churches fail, though religion fails, God, I feel the Holy Ghost. Though denomination fails, though preachers fail, I've heard so many people, you know, lots of things have happened in the last 10 years. I've heard lots of people say, well, I'm not going to church anymore. I, after that one failed, I just give up. Well, why would you want to go to hell? Because somebody else failed. And then you, sometimes things happen and somebody does something, you say, I'm not going to church anymore. Well, I'm going to ask you this. Did God do it to you? Did God hurt you? Did God let you down? Then why would you blame him? Do you know people have a habit of blaming God for everything? Well, I'm getting some looks here tonight. Lots of people blame God, the very one they should never blame. They blame him. Seems like it's easier to blame God and it's easier to blame a man of God. Lots of people put the blame. Instead of having appreciation, instead of appreciating, they blame. God, it's getting cold in a whippersnapper up here. Instead of appreciation, they blame. There's people right here in this building, and I'm sure, that have had misfortunes and failures, and you've blamed everybody in the world, but the one needs to be blamed. It's just not easy to face the responsibilities of self. Instead of appreciating Jesus when he came walking into, into the yard, Mary and Martha did not appreciate him. They blamed him. Where were you when we needed you? If you'd been here four days ago, my brother had not died. Instead of appreciation for him finally coming, they were wanting to indicate you failed us. But I'm here to tell you God never fails. And he's never late. He's always on time. There's lots of people like Martha and Mary that leave the implication that you're supposed to drop everybody in the whole universe. And when I call, you're supposed to be right there right, just like that. If you're not, I quit. And if you're not, I'm blaming you. It's your fault. Well, honey, I got news for you. Though he can keep the whole universe going, though he upholds all things by the word of his power, though he does have time for everyone, and when it seems like he's not on his way to your house, when it seems like he's lost your address and phone number, I'm here to tell you that he has not lost power. He has not lost contact. He has not closed his eyes when it comes to you. He has not forsaken you he has not forgotten you he has not failed you he is still your father he is still your God he still has all power in heaven and earth and if you'll let him he will prove himself to you he may not be there exactly when you think he should be there but I'll guarantee you one thing if you'll hang on and hold on and learn to wait upon the Lord he will be there and heaven and earth will pass away and God's word will never fail you and never let you down well somebody glory to God said praise the Lord it's too easy to blame you know I, I, I preached I've preached to millions over the last 25 years and I find that people so easily blame and they blame a man of God they blame a man that preaches the truth 
That's like blaming a doctor for finding a cancer. It's not the doctor's fault. Hello? If a doctor has the skill and the technological abilities and facilities and equipment to indicate or, dic or, or, or kind of pick up on something wrong in your body, well, you don't come in there when he tells you I've got bad news and he tells you this or that's happened to you. You don't pick up something throwing him. You don't jump on him. And when something goes wrong, you're not supposed to jump on God. It wasn't God. It was the devil that fought you. I know the devil filled you with fear. It's the devil filled you with doubt. Don't blame God. Instead of blaming him, appreciate him, love him, praise him, worship him. You'll get a lot farther if you will praise him and love him as opposed to blaming him. And never look up. I'm getting cold away. Never look up and say, you don't love me, do you? If you have any spiritual sense at all, you know that's not true. Why, he loved you when you wasn't loved. He cared for you when you wasn't worth caring for. He saved you when the rest of the world thought you wasn't worth saving. And when he does something, he does it big time. And he don't care what anybody thinks about it. When he does it, he settles it. And when he forgives you, not only does he forgive you, he forgets what you did. He forgets what you were. Oh, God. He forgets what you did. He forgets your sins. Well, you think, about, I could preach a while on that. There's some things God can forget. He can forget your wretchedness. He can forget how rotten you were. Huh? Now don't go squirming now. He can forget how mean you were. He can forget how perverted you were. He can erase it from his memory how low down you were. I better get back here where it's safe. He can forget how low you stooped, how sin sick we were. And he can forget what was in your closet. Boy, somebody ought to say, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> About everybody in here ought to say, thank God. One of the things, honey, that I'm preaching to you tonight that he will not forget you. Yeah, but Brother West, I'm a miserable failure. All of us are. I don't worry about those fighting battles. It's the ones running around trying to show their 40 watt halos I worry about. I worry about people that forgot where God brought them from and point a finger of scorn and criticism and judgmental finger of, of accusation at people that perhaps aren't doing half as much or haven't done half as much as some of us did. But you see, that's the difference in going to religious churches and going to a place where a man of God puts a mirror on the wall. You can look into religion and forget where you came from and think God sent me to criticize, ridicule, and judge everybody and tell them all off, you know. 
Lots of preachers have that attitude. And they're not called to do that. I'm getting a cold way, but it's true. God sent us to tell people that no matter how far you went down, no matter how perverted you were, no matter how, how deep in sin you sunk, there's nothing that you have done that God cannot forgive and forget. And if he's forgiven you and forgotten what you did, your future is the brightest that it's ever been. The easiest thing God can handle about your life and about your very being is your past. Yeah, but now, Brother Will, sometimes people remind me. I'm not talking about poor, little, pathetic, frail people. They'll never forgive you. So don't tell them anything. Quit taking them on a tour of your closet. Quit sitting and sipping tea and drinking coffee and tell them your past. Well, well, the rest, I thought you were supposed to be opening up front and all about some things. You may think a person is your best friend until you go to confide in things in them that they may think, huh, 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 huh. Man, I was bad, but not that bad. And see, it's real easy for people to look at you and think you're worse than I was. And we're poor little old frail people. Human beings that don't forgive easy. I'll forgive you, but you better not do it again. Well, that ain't the way God does. God, Peter said, Lord, how many times should I forgive those that trespass against me? About seven times a day. That's about all Simon could stand. He cut your ear off. Seven times is enough to forgive. That's what he thought. Jesus said, I say not unto thee unto seven times, but I say unto thee unto 70 times seven. That's 490 times a day. I've been in Kentucky many times, but I don't believe I ever got any more serious looks. Right now, Brother West, there's a point that you just have to just stop forgiving. Well, you tell me, when is that point? Is it seven times Simon Bar Jonas? And then cut their ear off. And the truth is, I preach this all over Kentucky. Simon didn't mean to cut his ear off. I mean, he really didn't mean to cut his ear off. He missed. He was trying to cut his head off in my estimation. I don't believe Peter just cut your ear off. I believe he'd cut, trying to cut that guy's head off and missed. Of course, it'd be just easy for God to put his head back on. It wasn't his ear. You know, it'd make no difference to God. The problem ain't God. It's us. <laughs> When God forgives you, he forgets what you've done. And when you get so religious that you think you're God's judge and that you're only forgiven when I say so, then you're in more trouble than the man down in the altar begging God to have mercy on him. You'll sit back and say, I'm sure glad I'm not like her, praise God. Man, I've been in this good old way about 40 years. Hallelujah, you've probably been in the way of everybody in your family. <laughs> probably been in the way of everybody on the job. They think if this is religion and this is salvation and, and I have to be like her or like him, I ain't going. Run around, somebody say, how you getting along? I ain't doing no good, yeah. Who wants to be like that? 
That's some of your testimony. Somebody say, how you been getting along? I ain't done no good. Some of you said that today. I'm like the boy from New York. I hit a noise. <laughs> Who wants to run around somebody ain't doing no good? How effective is somebody that walks up to somebody that's in trouble and says, you know what you need? You need joy like I got. <laughs> well, how big is that going to go over? They'll pop pills and smoke dope and go down the road. He big powwow tonight. He big TP. He big truth. <laughs> Poor little old frail people. God says if you don't forgive, you may not like me for what I'm going to say. There's two things God can't forgive. One's blasphemy of the Holy Ghost and the other is to forgive someone who won't forgive others. And that's husbands and wives too. <laughs> and if you do go to church 20 years and finally get your husband to go to church and give his heart to God or get your wife to go to church, give her heart to God, for God's sake, when you get home on the night they get saved, that you've been going 20 years, don't be such an ignorant fool and get them at the table in the kitchen and say, now tell me what you've been doing. <laughs> because the truth is, you think you want to know. The flesh says, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but you don't want to know because you can't stand it. You can't take it. Boy, it's getting cold up here. Worst thing you ever done when you get saved is to go confess everything you've done to your wife or husband. Most of it winds up in separation and divorce because they don't have the ability to forgive it. They just don't have the power in their flesh to. They lay God aside and say, you stay out of this, Lord. I'm gonna knock him in the head something. I don't care what urge you get. I don't care what urges you. Don't confess it. And don't tell your neighbor. Stay off that telephone. Boy, I hit a noise again, didn't I? You can't believe everything you hear. And you're not supposed to relay everything that you heard. You know, lots of people don't understand. You know, we, we have a, 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 boy, I'm in trouble. We have a way of dramatizing things. Somebody can see a little green snake go across the road. By the time it gets to London, it was a 40-foot rattler. <laughs> we think we have to dramatize it to make people listen. Getting cold up here, Jesus. I base everything on the truth. Everybody say the truth. You didn't say it, everybody didn't say it. Everybody say the truth. The word truth means that which is real, that which is in reality, the reality of things. Truth, there's some things about truth. I preach this to a lot of you across this whole state. The truth about truth is that truth is precise. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. 
you always know where the truth is. You always know what the truth has to say. The truth cuts no corners for me or you. The truth is exact. The truth is precision. There's no guesswork in the truth. And Jesus said, you shall know the truth. The preciseness of the word. And that alone is what makes you free. To know the truth. And the truth will make you free. I know some of you are in a depressed state right now. I feel it in my spirit. I felt it when I got here. But there's hope for you. You say, my wife depresses me. My husband depresses me. And your feeling of depression, your feeling of being left out, your feeling of neglect, your feeling of all these things is based upon sensualism. And if you're not careful, you'll start saying, well, if God loved me, he'd do this or that. Honey, it's not if God loves you. God does love you. But it's a matter of accepting the preciseness of what he says about you. And number one, no matter who lets you down, no matter who fails you, no matter who lets you go, no matter who turns and walks away from you, God said, I will not fail you. God didn't do it. And you'll start coming out of this situation the moment you're man enough or woman enough or Christian enough or believer in his word enough and the preciseness of his truth enough to stand up and say, it is not you, husband. It's not you, wife. It's the devil trying to convince me that God has failed. When the truth is, and here's what I do. I say, God, I don't, it doesn't matter what I feel. I know you have never failed me. And I got news for you again tonight in Kentucky. I can't find in the word of God anywhere where he has any plans or even any intentions or thoughts, wishes or desires to fail me. Or you. Everything on this earth may fail. The food supply may fail. The water supply may fail. Money may fail. Your little refuge in life may fail. But God promised you, I will not fail you. I'm talking about a positive thing. Well, it looks like I'm not going to make it. You can't go by the things you see. The things that are seen are temporal. The things that are eternal are the things you cannot see. Except by the eye of faith. Yeah, but the doctor says I'm going to die. There was a woman coming home to die with an issue of blood. But she came right by where Jesus was. And when she touched the hem of his garment, things started changing. And it could change for you tonight. I'm talking about one that can empty wheelchairs. I'm talking about one that can heal. I'm talking about one that delivers. I pushed a wheelchair for years and preached divine healing. In a moment, the seed, and I said, God, when are you going to do it? I know you've already done it, but when are you going to manifest it? When are you going to bring Jay out of this wheelchair? You say, you really believe it? With all my heart, I believe it. Scoffers don't have any power to, or control over me. I'll die believing it. Somebody said, how long will you do it till I push him through the pearly gates and bump the steps of the throne? I didn't start to give up. I didn't begin to quit. I didn't preach this truth to deny it. It is real in my heart. It's real in my spirit. 
and it's real in my life. And I've had lots of people fail me. I'm not on a television station. I'm not on a radio station. But God never failed me. You'd be surprised how many people walked up to me in the last years and said, Brother West, I'm so sorry you're not on television radio anymore. The Lord led me to support you, but I didn't, and I'm sorry. It wasn't God failed. And America's in trouble today. And America needs a prophet on the air. America needs somebody standing for hours on television speaking these words that's being spoken tonight. They don't have to worry about being cut off and turned off because America's in trouble tonight. And people have, have strayed from God. They see the sparkle. But that sparkle will let you down. They see the glitter and the glamour and the entertainment, but that'll fail. You can go to the Grand Ole Opry, 30 minutes from there, it's all gone. You can go to the biggest meetings in the world. If the anointing's not there 30 minutes away, you'll say, I'd been better off stayed home. But let me tell you, when the anointing's there, when that Holy Ghost is there, when that anointing is there, it changes everything. God said, I will not fail you. When you have a need, you don't have to worry about me coming up and saying I don't have enough to supply it. You don't have to worry about me saying I don't have enough to sustain you. If I can hold the world up by the power of my word. If I can hold the, the universe in my hands, I can supply your needs. Please listen to me. You might say, well, Brother West, I don't see any way that God can help me. That's the great marvelous thing about him. He makes a way where there is no way. He becomes the way. He is the way. Whew, God Almighty. And when you can't see it, that's where he excels. I'm talking about when they tell me. I said, Lord, I'm in bad trouble. I owe taxes. I'll tell you what. You're not in so much trouble. God can make a way for you. I know one who pulled the money out of the fish's mouth at the word of God and paid the taxes. I'm talking about one tonight that cares about you. Now, you may have developed, it might have taken years for you to develop this inferiority complex spiritually to think that God doesn't care, that God doesn't love me, that he loves others more than me because others got more money than I got and this one drives a better car than I drive and they live in a bigger, better house than I drive, live in or whatever. That doesn't make any difference. You can find God and be happy if you live in a shanty beside the road. You hear me? Some prophets lived in little mud huts. But they had the power to take a kettle of oil at the word of God and tell a woman how to take that kettle and turn it into a house full of oil. I'm tell you, I feel the Holy Ghost. A little old prophet named Elijah, it didn't profit him nothing. He didn't get no money out of it. He just got a, a place to sleep in the loft and a bite of bread every now and then out of that widow woman's kitchen. But honey, let me tell you something. When he spoke the word of God, her faith you hear me? Her faith turned a handful of meal into a meal barrel full. She didn't do it. God did. Somebody say amen. I feel the Holy Ghost. And I'll tell you something else, honey. Moses' faith, something he heard God say at the Red Sea, turned an ocean and a sea that had them stopped into a highway of escape. God doesn't just deal in the natural. God can get into the supernatural where he rules and reigns. And you don't have to see what he's doing. He can work his mind above our mind. His ways are past finding out. All you've got to do is believe that he is.
Woo! and that he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him that he has a way where there don't seem to be a way that he can take nothing to make something take something make it greater make it grow make it bigger he can pay your bills without money he can put it in the hearts of men to turn things around for you he can send an angel to kick around in the heart of a banker he can send an angel to touch the heart of a judge or a lawyer. My God, I'm not talking about Buddha. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about the power of this universe. I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm talking about one that can kick your benefits out of that computer up there in Washington. I don't care how many of them got it tied up in red tape. He can break the tape and send it on to you. A little woman walked up to me one time. She said, Brother West, she said, they've held up our benefits and I forget not what and all it was. She said, we got a letter here about a week or two ago or something like that. Said that it looked like it would be years from my lawyer. Looked like it'd be years before our case and our benefits would come to us and we're desperate. We don't even have food to eat. We don't, we can't even get help down at the welfare and all just tell me the saddest story they said will you pray that God will help us and speed this up and help us get our benefits it's something that belonged to them honey they had it in seven days they got a letter from from it wasn't from their lawyers from somebody in one of those red tape organizations with the government they get you tied up in that tape they don't put they don't have to have a handcuff, they tie you up in red tape. Got a letter, said, your name was kicked out of the computers. I read the letter. Your benefits and a check in the amount of so-and-so, 60-some thousand dollars is on its way. They brought it to me, jumping up and down, happy as it could be. So you think about that, Brother West. The computer kicked it out. I said, I wonder who kicked the computer. <laughs> God done it, Jay. Your best friend may fail you and hurt your feelings and disappoint you. Lots of things may have happened that hurt you and caused you to get into this old stupor you're in. But I'm here tonight representing one who is greater than a statue of Buddha. Well, glory to God. I'm here to represent one who is not a, just a historical Jesus. I'm talking about the only Jesus. <laughs> glory to God. I mean one who loves you with an everlasting love who has eternal compassion upon you, who has concern about you enough to say that if you are mine and you are called by my name and you're not ashamed of me, I won't be ashamed of you. And you love me and you do your best to serve me and, and you are filled with my spirit and you are washed in my blood, then you are mine and I've made some promises to you and one of them is that I will not ever fail you. You may think I'm late, but I'm never late. You may think that I won't be there, but I'll be there. Come on here. He said, I will not fail you. All you have to do is just praise me and love me and worship me and be thankful to me and remember and always realize that everything you have, I gave it to you. I managed it. I fixed it up till you could have it. Don't ever think you got what you got by your own hand because I can take it from you and leave you without. I can make you poor. I can make you rich. I can make you alive. I can kill you. You say, well, he wouldn't do that. You read the book again. It, it's all, most of it's up to you. you see, he said, I can make you rich. I can make you poor. The outcome of that depends upon how you take him at his word, how you appreciate what you get when you get it, whether you forget him or remember him when you get it. 
I, I was thinking outside the seat, and I, the, one of the greatest ways that people can show God their faith in an ongoing way, and lots of people, you know, people get mad at me when I say this, and I'm not here tonight to hurt your feeling, but I'm here just to tell you the truth. One of the best ways you can show God as a Christian that you are faithful is in your giving of offerings and tithes in an ongoing way. It's easy to give it when you got plenty. But it's when you get down, it's in the testing where God lets it look, makes it look like you ain't got nothing, you're going to have a hard time. Then he wants to see. That's when he watches the closest. Call the power company and tell them, looks like you ain't going to have the money to pay the bill this time, but just catch it some other time. They'll say, you ain't going to have no power either. <laughs> Call a telephone company. Tell them, say, I'm running a little short this month. I ain't going to be able to pay all these long distance phone calls, but you just hang on. I'll get to you around about somewhere or another, around the bend. I'll get up with you. You'll go there about the next day and you'll pick the phone up. Hello? Hello? He's gone. No phone. Same way with God. Oh, I just had to throw that in. That didn't cost you a dime. That'll help you pastors. So I said, well, I'll tell you, Brother West, I don't believe in tithes because that was of the Old Testament. That was the old order. And uh, that was under the law, praise God, and I've been uh, released from all that. I don't have to worry about that, you robber, you. You've listened to somebody lie to you. You believe the lie. Ties didn't start under the law. They started back when God made a covenant with Abraham by promise. And his faith was, and obedience was imputed to him for righteousness. I'm getting a cold wave, but it ain't going to cost you anything. And the promise was to Abraham and his seed after him, which was Jesus Christ, who came after the law. And the law, which was 430 years after, could not disannul that which was given by covenant or promise or faith. The law was like a dump truck. It just picked up part of that and carried it through. The law didn't start it. The law did not have the power to stop it. When Jesus took the law to the cross and nailed it to the cross, he wasn't talking about the covenant made with Abraham and the covenant was established in him. Some of you better get a hold of this thing. You better understand. I don't know how you feel about it, but I don't want to stand before God a robber. hurt my feelings. No, honey, I won't hurt your feelings. I'll hurt your beliefs. I don't want to stand before God a robber. You show God your faith. He'll show you his favors. God wants to see your faith. Come on. I'm going to tell you this, honey. He'll never fail you. And he's not to be blamed, my people. He's not to be blamed. And you're not to blame his prophets. You're not to blame his prophets. You're to believe them. You're not to blame God. You're not to always, if something goes wrong, say it's all your fault. It's not his fault. There may be various reasons why you're going through what you're going through. You say, well, maybe God's trying to find out something about me. No, honey, he ain't trying to find anything out about you. He already knows everything there is to know about you. He knows tonight the moment you're going to die. He knows exactly the precise second your heart will stop and you'll not breathe anymore. He already knows everything there is to know about you and everything else that exists. They're searching in laboratories tonight trying to find out what God already knows. Let's just settle it right now. We're not talking about Farrakhan who claims to be Jesus and Elijah. He's a deceiver. He's a liar.
The only thing Farrakhan's trying to do is cause a racial war. He's backed by Gaddafi and the Middle East over there and people like Saddam Hussein that'll put billions. They have given him billions of dollars. I didn't say millions, billions. Because he's got his foot in the door in America trying to cause a racial war, turn people against one another over the color of skin and bring this idiotic, crazy, demon-possessed religion in here that would destroy every Christian in the world if it could. Because, honey, the Jesus of 2,000 years ago was not a historical Jesus. He was not an imposter. He was God Almighty come down to this earth in the body of flesh. He was the Word made flesh. And there are deceivers. But there's not very many got the guts nor the nerve or the faith to stand up and speak it across the airwaves. Even the heads of your largest organizations and the heads of your largest satellites are afraid to speak out against it. It's time people to understand that these men cause failure. God never fails. Hallelujah, God never fails. God didn't fail. Today. Can I have just a few more minutes? God didn't fail David when he fought a bear. He didn't fail him when he fought a lion. And he went out there that day and it didn't matter how hard that the people looked at him, how much his brothers disrespected him. It didn't matter how much Saul disrespected David and told him that giant will kill you. And all of this and disheartened him, trying to discourage him, trying to make him afraid. It didn't matter what was said by family or friends or anyone else. It didn't matter what was said about the leadership of that army. David said, I fought a bear and God gave me a favor. I fought a lion. I grabbed him with a beard and I slew him. And God, who delivered me out of the hand or the paw of the bear and the lion, will give this uncircumcised Philistine into my hands today. Today! Saul failed. Lots of things failed. But David stood down there with a slingshot and five smooth stones and knew that God never failed him. And David committed sin. David did great wrongs in his life. Do you know that? David conspired and lied and cheated and killed, done lots of things that was wrong. But God said, he's still the apple of my eye. He's a man after my own heart. There was something about David's heart that even though he injured himself in sin, and sin injures you, sin hurts you, sin brings you down. But I'm gonna tell you right now, honey, you keep your heart straight with God. You may fall on your face and there's not a person in here that's not subject to make a mistake and fall. It doesn't matter to me how long you've been in this way. You can make a mistake before you get home tonight and fail. But there's one who never fails. He doesn't even know what that word means when it comes to himself. Oh, may fail you, honey. He won't fail you. God didn't fail David. Even though he committed sin with Bathsheba and the baby died, look how God could take catastrophe and turn it around. You say, well, I've had all kinds of failures. I've got four or five marriages and people don't like me. They won't let me come to church. That's their loss. You keep going. Don't you give up. You have to just tell me I can't go to heaven. Don't you? Who do you believe, them or God? These poor little old pathetic preachers, that's all they had to pick on. I think I'd find me another job. Do you ever, did you ever stop to think why Jesus let those apostles go into the town of Sychar and get vittles, which is bread and lunch meat and probably 7-Eleven? Or convenience store? He wanted to get rid of them. He wanted to get them away from him. You know why? Because he was going out there and going to meet a woman out there that had been married five times, now living with a man. He was going to release her, set her free, reveal himself to her, give her a message, and call her to carry a message to a town and get that whole city saved. Well, I want to ask you a question tonight. I'm going to preach and 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 preach here tonight. 
I want to ask you a question. I wonder what would happen if Simon Peter had been there and Jesus asked for a drink of water and she said, how is it that you would you ask me for a, a drink of water? She said, I'm a Samaritan. We don't have any dealings. Don't you know what Simon would have done? He'd probably grab her by the hair of the head and cut her ear off and throw her in the well. We got them all over Kentucky, get up in the pulpit. They never bring bread to people. They never bring life to people. They get up and criticize, point fingers, tell them all this and that and condemn them and browbeat them and put them down. I didn't come to do it. I came to tell you God loves you and he cares about you and all he won't fail. You mean if I made a mistake, even if you made a mistake, you mean if I had two or three bad marriages, even if you got two or three bad marriages, I know that they won't let me in most denominations and I got news for you, I don't want in them. If they'd make me the head of it, I wouldn't have it. I don't get my messages from Bible bookstore shelves. I don't get my messages from headquarters in pamphlets with an order from headquarters that says you better preach this or else. Ain't nobody molds me or shapes me. Nobody dangles me on the end of a string. If God can't give it to me, man ain't going to. I came to tell you what God's got to say out of the heart of this preacher that I know he called and spoke to me in an audible voice. Ain't too many churches in Kentucky would want that woman to well. They'd watch her come in, they'd say, there she is. That's why Jesus let them go on in. What do you think James and John would have done? If they'd have been there and heard her sass Jesus, and he, she sassed him. Oh, you, some of you did too. Preacher got up and gave an altar call and you said, no! And don't bother me and leave me alone. I ain't come back no more. You'll sass the daylights out of him. What would James and John have done? Listen to this. What would James and John have done if she'd have said, I'm not giving you a drink. You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. I ain't giving you no drink. You know what they'd done? They'd say, Lord, John's called fire down out of heaven and burn this well up in her too. Huh? Some of you look like you're dazed. I wish you were dazzled, but not dazed. <laughs> Amen. God took a woman, been married five times, now living with a man openly in town, sent her with a message after he revealed who he was, Said, I that speak unto them, he talked about the Christ, revealed himself to the, be the Christ to her. She ran back to town, left her water bucket on the well box, and run back to town telling everybody, I found a man. Wonder how many of them said, oh God, she's found another man. <laughs> now that's what you got to deal with in religion. Bunch of sophisticated people skeletons with suits on sitting around trying to dictate their own bylaws and rules to people and won't go to this book because it makes them realize that they are just a sinner saved by grace as well as the congregation. God didn't put me over you and above me. God put me with you. God wants me to stand beside you and when I preach to you I have to make a distinction and let you know that it's not me but it's Christ in me the hope of glory if I have any revelation it's not of my own knowledge it's the power of the knowledge of God and I'm not here to please organization denomination, tradition, religion you, Kentucky anyone else I'm here to please God and if I please him the world has to get in line. I got a cold wave. I know how to turn that air conditioner on, honey. God can take catastrophe and turn it into miracles. God took David, listen to this, 
And Bathsheba committed terrible wrong. Do you believe that? Conspired and lied, had a man killed. David didn't throw the sword or the, sh uh, or the spear. David didn't shoot the arrow that killed Uriah the Hittite. But as sure as I'm standing here in the eyes of God, David killed that man. Amen. And the prophet came and told him and the baby died. But God took that catastrophe and turned it around. The next child born to Bathsheba and David was Solomon. He became the wealthiest and the wisest man that ever lived upon this earth besides Jesus Christ. You may have a catastrophe in your life. You may have failed miserably. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you went down real low in sin. But that doesn't mean God can't bring you back. People may never forget. They may never forgive. But God will. God said, I'll not fail you. God said, I will not forget you. And I will not forsake you. I'm almost a third done. I'm going to have to hurry. Lots of things fail. You going to church tonight? No, I ain't going. Why? They cut my social security check, $20, and God shouldn't have let them done that. Well, it wasn't his fault. He didn't cause social security to fail. It was all them senators and congressmen we voted up there and didn't pay any attention to what they believed. can't get mad at a politician for killing babies with abortion if we knew he believed in abortion before we voted him in. I tell you, he's a pretty good man. She's a pretty good woman. I believe they're the person for the job. I know they believe in abortion, stuff like that, and you know, and everything like that. But that's all they're pretty good. They ain't pretty good enough to be in there if they don't believe if they don't believe the truth, if they don't believe what this book says. If they stand and their principles are against that, we don't need to put them in. And I know that those Supreme Court judges up in Washington, D.C. are pretty intelligent and they have been educated to the fullest extent of the educational process in the field of law. My brother's a successful attorney and, and has made probably a lot of money doing it. And I'm going to tell you something, he, he's intelligent and they're intelligent too. But I stand sometimes in awe at some of the decisions they bring out of those chambers when it comes to homosexuality and things like the right to speech or freedom to speech. It's got now this internet thing has become something that's running rampaging and wild and children can turn pornography and illiterate things or, or all kinds of these things are coming right into our houses and they don't know the distinction in Washington between that which is good and that which is not good. And you don't take a man with a big brain to understand the difference between filth and something good. Simply because somebody's so perverted in their heart and their mind and they're so desperate down in their soul and their spirit that they can't say a sentence without cussing, using vulgar language and want to express themselves in some vulgar, pornographic way. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't have some kind of a ban and control on it to stop our little children. that are coming up to somebody and say, well, they'll grow up and learn better. They won't grow up and learn better. If you don't teach your children from the time they're toddlers about Jesus, they're not going to learn it in the system out here because they don't want Jesus. Honey, this world don't want it. It wants what it wants and they don't want what they need. They want what they want. Amen. Better start teaching them. Now I believe in nurseries in, in church. I believe in nurseries, but kids ain't supposed to live in nurseries. They're supposed to be a sitting right there with you listening to what the preacher's got to say. Somebody said, oh, they don't understand. Don't tell me they don't understand. Jason, my little grandson's two years old. He's already preaching. <laughs> He's got him a microphone and he gets up on the coffee table and preaches. I don't understand one word he said, but I'm glad God does. Yes, they learn. Why, there's hundreds of little boys and girls across this country 
little old toddler's two years old. The moms and dads come to them and say, Brother Westy, get a mop handle, a broom handle or something. And that's their microphone. They preach all over the house. They want to be like you. I said, thank God. I'd rather see them want to be like me than Elvis. I'd rather see them want to be like me than Elton John. So your prejudice, maybe just a little. I'd rather see them want to be like a preacher than these perverts on television. I ain't going to get into that too much. I feel like I hit a snag. I don't mind hit snags, though. Snags let you know there's briars in the field. Lots of things have failed our nation. We have, been, we have become almost like prisoners to laws that we shouldn't be have to, having to try to conform to. They're trying to force decent, moral people to go along with this crazy, pornographic world. And I'm going to tell you, somewhere it's got to stop. It's got to stop. Somewhere, somebody's got to stand up and say, there's a difference in freedom of speech and freedom of speech. Freedom of speech doesn't mean that somebody can stand in the schoolyard and cuss and cavort and use terrible, vulgar, perverted language and you can't do anything about it because they have a right to express themselves. Well, honey, it's time for people to get back to God and understand what's causing the expression, which spirit's motivating that body. You speak because of the abundance of your heart, from the heart and its abundance is what you speak, Jesus said. Our children's hearts are filled with terror. They're filled with everything in this world. Even to the cartoon. I'm getting cold wave here, Lord. Even to the cartoons that's on Saturday morning now. It's turned into witchcraft and wizardry and sorcery and demonology and all of these things. And now people don't believe and their little children are growing up not to believe. And I tell you, one of the worst lies that's ever been told is about Santa Claus. And I'm not here to pick on Christmas, but I'm here to tell you that's one of the biggest lies that Satan's ever promoted out of the regions of hell. And a nation that can believe that Mickey's alive and Minnie's alive in Los Angeles and Mickey's alive in Florida is a nation that I'm worried about. We become lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Amen. Amen. Some of you right here, you can get mad if you want to, but you send your children to Sunday school and church where they have a good promotion of, of activities and playtime. You better let them learn. The only chance they've got, you've got to get Jesus instilled in their heart by the time they hit school. Because from the time they get them in our educational system, they're going to start right then trying to disprove God, drive God out of their thoughts and out of their hearts. And that's Satan's motive, is to get God out of our minds, get him out of our hearts, get him out of our homes, out of our churches, out of our schools. They'd like to get God out of our world. But honey, one of these days he's going to end it. He's coming back. He's going to get his children out of this world. And honey, it'll be over for the rest of this world. Start teaching them. They won't go to school very long until they won't believe in God. A lot of them, some will, but it begins at home with you. Oh, I used to think my mom's the meanest person there was because she used to make me say grace at the breakfast table. Wouldn't let me take a bite till we prayed. Wouldn't let me go to sleep. I don't care if I was play acting. I, I remember even play acting, acting like I was asleep so I wouldn't have to pray. She'd wake me up, drag me out of that bed, get me right down, and she'd be between me and my brother Butch, and we both had to pray. You say, well, you're not supposed to make your children. Yes, you are too. They're children. They can't make their own way. I know people up in West Virginia right now got 12-year-old little old girls, 12, 13 years old. Let them dress like they're 22, 24. 
You dress one up and fix one up till it looks like when it's 12 years old, it looks like it's 20. You can't, you can't stop the perverts from wanting to attack her. You better believe you got to tell them. My boy's Jay's 30 years old, married and got a child. Michael Paul's be 17 in May. They're not going to, I'll tell you right now, I'm not, they're, they're mine. Somebody said, why won't you let them do this and that? Because they're mine. Well, everybody else's is, well, they can, but not mine. So, well, Jay's married and got a family. That don't make no difference to me. I still demand his respect. And I'm the best friend he's got. I'm better to him than anyone is besides God. But there's just some things that you have to demand. Say, well, now, Brother West, they got their own lives to live. Yeah, but not at 12 years old. A little girl 12 years old cannot, cannot dictate what her future should be. She ain't got enough sense. That little boy is 12 years old. He ain't got enough sense to make him plan his own way. Is that enough meddling? <laughs> Look, honey, I deal with this all the time. It's not something I do one or two days a week. It's seven days a week, 24 hours a day with me. I haven't had a vacation in 31 years. I wouldn't even know where to start on one. They know where I want to go. If I got there, I'd have to come straight back because I just couldn't leave it. I deal with it all the time. I see kids come into my meetings barking like dogs, chirping like birds. Their brains burned out on drugs and dope. They've run to everything trying to find hope, trying to find something to satisfy. Let me tell you where it starts. It starts in the cradle. It starts in the bassinet. It starts in when they're laying in your arms and you're rocking them to sleep. It starts singing about Jesus to them. It starts when you tell them about who made this earth and who made this world. It starts and you don't have to worry about them when they go to school and somebody's trying to teach them that, it, that God didn't do it. It just all evolved. They're going to stand out there and say, well, that, that isn't what I believe. I believe that a supreme being did this. You say, well, it's going to cause the child trouble. Jesus said in, that this world loves its own. You'll find written Job's writings that man's born of one a few days and full of trouble. I stay in trouble. Wonder why. It doesn't matter how low you sink. That's just the message America needs. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen. Jesus' hands are stretched out to this nation. And he deserves the chance to help our children and our people. But you may not like what I'm going to say right now. They're not finding it in our churches. You cannot instill in our children the qualities that they need in God by letting them go to church at a certain place because they have checkers on Tuesday night. Ain't wrong to play checkers, but you play that at home. Church is where you learn about God or should be learned about God. <laughs> Amen. We need to instill in them the fiber of God's truth, the preciseness, the exactness. And moms and dads, listen to me. We should never go through the house complaining and grumbling over this because most all of us are well maintained. We have a bed to sleep in. We have a home to live in, a roof over our head, transportation, food, good food to eat, clothing to wear. We should never let a murmuring, mumbling, complaining word come out of our mouth in front of our children because we'll bring them up and raise them up to be blamers of God. 
we need to come through and thank God for the soup, beans, and the onions. Glory to God. And if you got cornbread, say a double prayer. Hallelujah. Thank God for it all. Somebody say amen. Because, honey, it ain't Kroger. It's not Food Line. It's not Walmart that causes these things to grow out of the earth. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the power of his continuance. should instill in our children they should be able to see and remember and have it branded in their brains and their minds that my mom and dad gives God the glory for everything we've got even for our shoestrings and our shoes God gives it to us my dad my mom thanks God for everything we've got they thank God for being able to have a telephone and for the money to pay the bill they thank God for the food on our table and the clothes we wear and instill it in their hearts to know that by their own hands you can't accomplish much, but with God all things are possible to them that believe. Somebody say amen. I've told my boys, if anything should happen to me, to always remember that the God that never failed their daddy will never fail them. They've seen me under the load. They've seen me bent over carrying the load of of the pressures of, of reaching the people and telling and standing for the truth. To the point I've heard Jay say, man, I don't know if I'd want to be a preacher or not. I've seen my dad go through so much. But I have to leave this message with him if something should happen to me. That the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of this book that I found walking out of the pages into my heart, has never failed me. And everything I am or ever hope to be and everything I have, he's responsible for it. He gave it to me. He's my father. He's my Lord. He's my God. He's my king. He's the lily of my valley, the rose of Sharon. He's the bride and the morning star. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the ending. He's the one put the comet out, John. He's the one who caused the galaxies to be. And he holds me in the palm of his hand. And said, I will not fail you. He said, I will not forsake you. Everybody may leave you. Your friends may turn against you. I'm trying to hurry now. We need to instill in our children this thought and this truth. And train them in the way they should go. Till if they wind up in a hog pen, they will remember that God said, I will not forsake you. It wasn't God that forsook the prodigal son. It wasn't his father. It was his, it was his fault. He walked away and could have died in the hog pen, but he started thinking right. That's what we need. We need our teenagers to put a new value on life. Did you know when 39 people, I believe it was, committed suicide, mass suicide in San Diego last night, don't you know that that is a loss of the ability to judge the quality and the, and the worth of life? Jim Jones led 900 and some people to a mass suicidal death. People's lost all, lots of people have lost all the ability to value life. Teenagers, we've been here since what, 7.30. Some of you got here a little earlier. Started the service. It's now around almost 10 o'clock in the last two and one half hours. Probably three teenagers have taken their life across America. One every 90 minutes takes their life and sees that life is no longer worth living. Why? Because we've taken God out of our schools. We've taken God out of our homes. We've, we've slapped the face of God in our courtrooms. We've taken the Constitution, which is one, one of the most important documents in the world today. But we've taken it and we've allowed men to give their own versions and perverts to push their, their thing upon us. And we've allowed our, our lawmakers to, to come to a place to where they're trying to dictate to us that we must conform to the perversion of this world. Well, brother, I'm not conforming form into it. It's wrong for a man to love a man. It's wrong for a woman to want to marry a woman. 
And it's hellish wrong for a court system to try to even vote on laws to make laws to let them adopt children. If they want children, let them get them the way they're supposed to get them. Let them do what's sensible and right. Getting cold up here, Jesus. Why in the name of God would a little three-day-old baby just coming out of a nursery in a hospital somewhere where somebody just gave it up for adoption, why should it be subjected to be raised up in a home where two ugly men's going to be mommy and daddy? Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't like it. That baby didn't ask for it and it don't deserve it. I say let them have all they want as long as they can have them the right way. Bunch of cop-out perverts. You say, well, well, how's God feel about it? You need to go back and read what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah and you'll know exactly how he feels about it. And he says he's going to do it again too. Well, I'm not going to say young people. I'm going to say this to you young folks. I'm not going to say that Satan may not come to you and tempt you and give you thoughts about someone of the same sex that you are. I'm not going to say that that won't happen, but I'm going to say this. You better fight it. You better withstand it. You better plead the blood of Jesus because it's not natural. It's not normal. I don't care what people say. It doesn't matter about their sex preference. It's not that at all. It is a perverted nation and world that has written a new book on new feelings that God says are abominations. And lots of things have failed. But God never fails and God does not forsake his children. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He said, Lo, I am with thee always, even to the end of the world, Jesus said. Now that's a promise to you. Do you believe that? He will not fail you. He will not forsake you. He will not go away from you. He will not abandon you. He will not leave you. Listen to me just for a few moments as I finish. He will not leave you. He said, well, it feels like he left me, but he hasn't. Feelings has nothing to do with it. It's what he said. I am down here in Renfro Valley, Kentucky. My wife, Marcia, is in West Virginia. I can't see her. She's a couple hundred miles or 150 miles, whatever it is up there, away from me right now. But you know something? I don't have to see her to know she's still mine and I'm still hers and we're still married. I don't have to have a wedding ring on, which I'm proud to wear. That isn't what married us. I didn't fall in love just with a body. I fell in love with her heart and her spirit and her life. And I love her. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Feelings ain't got anything. I can stand right here and convince myself she don't care, but I know she's 150 miles from here. When I get home tonight, she'll be right there just as bright eyes as she has been for the last 31 years. Well, what if? Ain't no what ifs about it. I believe it. I believe God whether I feel him or not. I believe he's with me whether he feels like he's there or not. I don't base my relationship with God on feelings. I love the feelings and you do too, don't you? Sometimes you get the good feelings, don't you? But when it comes down to emotional feelings, you can't base your, your, your goals on just feelings. You got to take what God says. It's he that hears his sayings and do what he says. If you'll do what he says, you'll prosper and you'll, you'll be blessed. Somebody say amen. He said, I'll not forsake you. That means I'll not abandon you. I'll not leave you. I'll not go away from you. It doesn't matter what's going on. Just talk to him. He's right there, but I don't feel him. You don't have to. He's right there. Come on. He's right there. How do you know? Because he said so. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And last but not least, he said, I'll never forget you. You ever felt forgotten? I'm going to tell you something. All my experiences over the last, especially 25, 26 years that I've been on the field full time, one of the awfulest things that I've ever had to face and go through in battle is the feeling of being forgotten. There was a time that our little old ministry grew and reached 83 nations. But I found out 
that they don't want Jesus' name in these nations. We'll not let anyone speak against the name over our church door, but lots of people let people speak against the name of the door. And I found out it took me, and it hurt me deeply. And I really realized and found out that everybody goes church doesn't love Jesus' name. His name is the highest name. I think it's an honor and I think we should be proud.